my name is Jordan Yaker. I am the CEO and creator of HireRoss.com. HireRoss is a platform focused on the idea of using a sort of automated solution that we have called Ross. Uh, come find me later if you have a guess as to what the Ross acronym stands for. I have candy for every guess that you decide to try and venture. No guess is too outrageous. I've heard a lot of good ones today. We use Spark with streaming in order to handle background processing of data to tackle payment slicing and balance tracking problems for large scale enterprises. Now, a lot of us want streaming applications especially to just keep running nicely and not run into any problems, but ultimately we run into issues. Now with Spark, there are a lot of ways that these issues can be manifested, be captured and be handled, but ultimately they can end up just cratering the entire thing. And so rather than having bad data which can come through the application and just totally wreck everything, we want to end up having a solution that can take the handling of errors down to the record level but not become too difficult. And that's where we get to the concept of monads. So a monad is an incredibly abstract concept and when you're talking about it you've got to say okay well what is a monad? It's a thing that can encapsulate other things that you can do things against and you can chain those things together and maybe sooner or later you'll be able to get an answer as to whether or not all of those things worked. And it's super weird and obscure and the reality is that monads in a lot of ways just become like the Schrodinger's cat of computing. At the end of the day you can do what I've decided to call in our application trimonads. And a trimonad is going to be a successful result or an error. You have a piece of code which, encapsulate a, which encapsulates a successfully returned value or it's an exception. And you can keep chaining it together with functions as you go through processing within your Spark app. Now because this is a piece of code, all you have to do is just pass it to the mapping functions. You can create function providers which wrap your monads and then everything can be chained together for later evaluation. But again we get back to the idea of what does this actually help you do. You end up cleaning up the streams a lot. Rather than having exception captures everywhere in every function you can have wrappings so that you go from per function error handling to per record error handling. And you can defer that so that you get the option and the opportunity to invoke something, capture an exception and just punt on it for later. Now it's a lot nicer to have this because rather than the alternative of error checks and functions if statements try and escape or try, try, uh, try and accept, you end up with wrappers that can capture your monad results. The great thing about this too is that there are libraries out there and there are two main libraries that I ended up going with and doing the investigation on as part of this process and that's O slash and pymonad and all of those provide the features that you need which is the idea that you encapsulate a value so you capture it you put it in a context you chain it together with other captured values or results and then you just send it off to a function those are all the things that you need the great thing about this is that it is super simple and it doesn't add any additional complexity to your code I'm going to be posting this up for use later for everybody. I've created a gist that actually displays the trimonad that I've written. And it's really simple because it's based on an existing pymonad implementation. If you look at the core implementations of most of these libraries, they're going to have what they call an either monad. And the either monad is going to have either one type of value or another type of value. And when you get to the end, you get to see the results 
and you can analyze which type they are, whether they're left or right. Instead of doing that, I've taken the concept of either to be just straight success or failure. And in this fashion, you end up with objects that you can simply just check if it was a success or if it was a failure when going through and cleaning up for your successes or your errors. The next question is obviously, how do you test it? And the answer is, it's not any different than just plain old Python code. As you can see here, this is a piece of test code. And that's my thumb. And so right here, I have the function which returns the monad. I have a check to see if it was a successful result. And then I have the piece of code which actually gets the internals to the monad. Again, it just focuses on the idea that all we're talking about is containers to hold values which may or may not be an exception. So, on average, if you were just doing this in a normal application and using it to chain function calls together, you wouldn't have to worry about half the stuff that you have to with PySpark. You add a lot of excess concern when you're doing stuff with PySpark because <coughs> PySpark works on top of the Java VM and it has to serialize objects back and forth to Java space when doing the operations. So you have to be very careful when using monads. It's super easy to take the approach of saying that we're just gonna jam whatever exception or whatever object gets returned by a function into a monad object, but that monad becomes a context that is being carted around for the rest of your application or until you evaluate successes and failures. And what ends up happening is that if you don't ensure that the object inside of that is serializable, your application will barf on you and it will not tell you why. Whenever I started with the implementation of this in the first version around, I had that problem a lot until I realized that it was basically because the objects were trying to carry around things that were not serializable. Additionally, because you're doing map and reduce functions and you're going from things that are iterable to non-iterable, depending on the function that is invoked, you need to be careful with how you're returning the monads. Because if you're returning a monad which wraps an iterable collection, that in and of itself is not iterable, which means that if you're going from a simple map function to a map values to a flat map, then you might have to unpack or you might have to actually wrap the contents of the monad itself and expand it out into an iterable depending on the situation. But this is highly subjective and it's really going to depend on your application. Finally, make sure to actually do something with the errors. Just because you're deferring on them doesn't mean that you can't, you know, just ignore them, which is incredibly easy to do. You can't forget those errors, they were there for a reason, even if that means just dumping them into a dead letter queue for examination later in another Kafka stream or into uh, Cassandra DB, you've got to do something with those errors. There was a reason that they occurred. So I wanted to acknowledge before jumping in to take a look at some of the uses of the monads within actual code examples, um, the resources that I used for this talk. Um, Dag Bratley and Jason DeLatt, they're the two who created the O slash library and the PyMonad library. And then I ripped off the uh, Schrodinger's cat comic from Be A Bird Comics. So really quickly, I'm gonna dig in here and show a couple examples of the application, how we're using them with Ross, and then have time for questions because I know this is a very subjective and abstract concept, so I wanted to leave enough time for conversation here. Uh, 
All right, so the way that we ended up architecting ROS is through using a series of functional compositions. And most often, you will see these in functions that are simply applied to mappers. All right, thank you very much. Hey, look at that. All right. So the Monad impl implementation that you're going to see is going to be extended from an either, impl either Monad implementation that was created by Jason DeLatte, so try and do what I can to throw out uh, the originator of the actual code. And again, it just has a series of functions which apply the basic principles of Monads. And that's the idea that you can take these contextual objects, you can chain them together, and this core functionality here, the F map, the A map, and the bind is what makes all of that possible. And you can see that I have the success and the failure implementations. And these are the two core pieces that are actually used by the project in the implementations where the monads make things possible. So let's take a look at we go. Our calculations mappers. Ugh. Too many windows. This is one of the reasons I don't like VS Code. All right. So here we have a compute calculation function. And what this does is this applies an abstract calculation to a record within a stream. If that calculation succeeds, then it passes the result into a success monad as a tuple. If it fails, it passes it into a failure monad. I don't have to do anything with it here other than that simple check. Now, one of the updated version branches that we have actually defers this even more and takes it to a higher level so that you are actually passing in these functions themselves to a wrapper function which takes care of handling the checking and the returning of the results in either a success or failure, so that it's one spot to actually deal with the manipulation of these successes and failures. And this is it. The actual code that goes in testing this really just checks to see, okay, if this was a success, let me look at the internals of this. And the handler functions are just a mapping of the successes out in order to continue the pipeline and then you handle the errors. Like here. In a fashion where you're doing whatever you want with them. In this case, we're taking failed writes to the Kafka stream or failed writes to Cassandra for whatever reason and dumping them into a dead letter stream for handling later manually or through some yet to be architected uh, automated process. So, that is it. Questions? So, if, you're, if, if you have an RDD of data, you would map over it with monads. The output would be monads, or would be a new um, RDD full of monads. That's it. It depends on how you want to do it. So the point of the uh, monads, again, is that you can actually chain these things together. So if we look at one of the chains, right here, all you end up having to do is you pass back the functions which end up getting chained together to arguments. So you can see here this is the pairing of a function with an argument, and this is how you bind a monad argument with a monad uh, function or a functor, as it's called and you can merge together multiple arguments, as in this example right here, which takes two implementations that have already been processed and are monads in and of themselves, and it collapses them using a, um, a reduce. And so right here we see that, again, we have the function definition, which is uh, you have to use for certain ones, especially if you have more than one argument, you use this curry property, and then you just pass it in and return the result. 
the best advice that I can give anybody who's wanting to get into this and use this and apply it in their own Spark applications is that it is as easy and as fast to apply this as I've tried to apply here. Uh, when putting together this talk, I thought about going through and going into the high level stuff and digging into the um, academic level discussions because there is a lot there on the academic nature of monads. But honestly, I felt like that would drive home an idea that it is more complicated than it is. Using the monads in your code is super simple. And for us, the way that we found it is the benefits of doing this with Spark, again, because of the execution nature, because of the way that drivers and executors and workers are different and distributed, is so easily realized. Depends on how good your Spark or how good your Python is versus how good your Scala skills. So do you find it easy to implement like a really functional paradigm using monads and functors in, in PySpark? Oh yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, if you look at the way that we have set up our application, it is just a series of composed functions. And so, for us, at least our core team philosophy in building the streaming application, is that PySpark or no you can still follow the functional paradigm. You know, it's, uh, again, like uh, the easiest way is to go back and look at the handlers which actually do something with these compositions of things. And it's really just passing in the functions. So instead of lambdas, instead of anything else, we now have these monad implementations which end up running the entire application as a composable stack. The gist is actually the trimonad implementation. So uh, if you look at the gist, the gist is this. So you've got the trimonad implementation that if you add the package for uh, pymonad and you drop this into your project, you are good to go on your own success and failure implementations. And so from there, it's a question of what your successes and failures are to get to a really, really meta idea. Any other questions? Fantastic. Um, I think the last screen you had a uh, six Kafka method. Yes. Would that, would that be on the monad level? Like if you were mapping again over an RD, RD of monads? You absolutely can do that. So the way that, uh, because this is using a factory to conserve memory that is stored in the broadcast variables for our send to Kafka functional paradigm, what we do is we uh, invoke the um, partition level transformations. So it's doing a map partition, but it's doing that with um, what could be a monad implementation as well. Because we're doing flat map and uh, map values interchangeably, what ends up happening is we have a couple of interstitial uh, areas where we just extract everything out with get successes because get successes is uh, where it g actually goes through and it says, okay, let's evaluate what's going on right now and get rid of some of the failures. Again, if you're not doing a change from um, N to M, numbers in terms of the size of the, of the stream if you're not changing the uh, content of it, then you could, in theory, do it all the way to the end and actually only unwrap the successes at the point where you're dumping uh, a DStream into a data frame or a DStream and just looking and examining the RDDs. Awesome, so we got five minutes left. Other questions? Fantastic. So once everybody leaves, you can examine whether or not this was actually a good talk. Yeah? Great. Well, thank you very much, and hopefully everybody enjoys the rest of the day.